So please welcome Martin Norman. Yeah. Thanks for the, uh, for the kind words. Uh, yeah, I'm an engineer in architecture. Uh, I've been, uh, as, as Heidi said, GXN is, a, is an internal innovation. We're, we're trying to sort of drive the, the rest of the office into a, a greener uh, direction, but we need to do this by starting out by commencing a bit. We need to try out these, these things sometimes research projects on uh, funded projects where we can actually try out these things before we apply them in general to, to the bigger picture. Because no, build it, no client for a building will, will say, well, we're going to go full on on cradle to cradle without you having any credentials on, on how to do it. This, this happens sometimes. This is also what, uh, what one of the projects uh, will, uh, will, will be a bit about. Um, we're currently uh, nine architects, engineers, and designers. We just uh, started up a PhD with an architecture psychologist, the only one uh, educated uh, in that in Denmark. Um, I'll come back to that uh, in, in a bit. Because in, in GXN, we have these five uh, design strategies. Green design, informed design, behavior design, technology design, and experimental design. I'll, I'll try and run through these quite quickly, but I think they represent a good uh, sort of definition of who we are and what we actually do. Um, so if we start with technology design, this is taking technologies that are not necessarily ready for market or a good technology that could have good implement implementation in the build, in build environment, but the technology is not ready. Sometimes the technology is there, they know how to make it, they know how to produce it, they know what it does and they can quantify it, but they cannot sell it because it's not part of a building product. They don't have, a, sometimes they don't have a clue about how the architects think and how buildings are designed, which is an important, you need to understand this if you want to have your products used in buildings. This is, this is one of the examples, this is a, a sort of a microscopic blinding system. It is actually consisted of, of blinds, but on a very, very fine level. And they know how to do this, they know exactly how to produce this, they know what limitations are. They just, they didn't have a product. So we help them uh, with this, and, and that's one of the things we do. Behavior design is, is something, it's not new in architecture. We know that architecture affects how humans interact, it affects how we feel, it affects, in general, our mood. <coughs> Um, and this is what we've started up now with a PhD with an architecture psychologist. She, she's going to start out by, by trying to look at some of the buildings we've built, try and look at what were the ideas for, for how people interact in this building, and is that also the case in reality? So she's going to try and compare the sort of the concept and the, the, the actual building so that we can sort of gain knowledge on this and heighten our, our knowledge level. Uh, on that point. And I think this is, this is a really important point, this uh, tradition to do, to do architecture psychology in Sweden and Norway, but we have no tradition of it in Denmark. I think it's really important because ultimately buildings are for people. And no matter what we say about energy consumption and cradle to cradle, it's buildings are for people how those buildings then affect the environment, how much energy they use, that's also important, but, but ultimately it's, it's people-centered in, in architecture. Informed design is really trying, using tools to, to inform the design process of, of, the, of the architects. Um, this is fluid simulation of a, of a sail on a sailing boat. And this is how we can use computer simulations today. This is not in our field, so we're trying to take this into architecture. How can we help inform the design process into a, a, a better way, into a more sustainable way? How can we ensure that we have the daylight levels we want? How can we ensure we have the indoor climate that we want? Uh, this, for example, is, uh, is, this is just data visualized. This is wind data and uh, general climate data for Copenhagen. So we do our own tools to try and visualize, but also to, uh, to simulate. 
simulating daylight, simulating indoor climate on a very basic level because we don't need the detail in the early design process. A lot of these uh, decisions affect uh, the building later in its life. Um, the first, we, we tend to say that the first 10% of the design process affects 90% of the design. And it also affects 90% of the energy consumption. Whatever you do after a sketch phase is generally trying to rectify mistakes you made during the sketch phase. We try and do this early. If we can do these things really early, then we can sort of make sure that we don't do bad design that we then, then sort of try and compromise on. Experimental design is, is uh, it's a bit where we started. It's sometimes you don't need to make a lot of money. Sometimes it's good if you just break even. A project uh, could be this where we, we said, okay, how can we make a lamp? We got this material, sheeting material. It's uh, two pieces of aluminum bonded to a uh, non-conductive core, but you can lead current through the, the skin. So we tried to say, how can we use this to make a lamp? Uh, and we, we made this sort of light installation where all the electricity is wired on the outside and on the inside of these triangles. So you just actually drill a hole, put in, a, in an LED, and then there's light. Uh, another one is uh, a chandelier we made for one of the, the, uh, the architectural firm's uh, projects. It's a tensegrity structure, um, so it's basically comprised of pressure rods and tension wires. It's a very sort of elegant structure in the room. It's, uh, it's hung in. It really fits well. Um, the problem is that when you then go to the engineers and say, okay, we have this lamp, can we calculate on it? And the engineers say, yeah, sure. Then come back two days later, no, we can't. <laughs> the programs that we generally use are not designed for something as... This, this is not complex, this is quite simple, but the complexity in calculating it is apparently too big. So we had to, to go to, uh, I think we collaborated with a Russian uh, PhD student who were in Copenhagen. And it's, it's generally trying to sort of, we need to push the boundaries. And we do this by, by these, uh, these designs. This, uh, yeah, also hanging it, the problem with its insecurity structure is only stable when it's fully designed or fully uh, assembled, which means that until you put the last wire up and tension it, it's, yeah, it, it doesn't really work. So, so a huge knowledge was gained by us by just doing this project. We didn't really make any, uh, any, any money on it, but that's not the point. We gained a lot of knowledge that we can then use in later projects. Green design is then starting to move into, into cradle to cradle, but it's not just that. Uh, we're also working with a project currently where we're trying to design uh, vegetated roofs, but we're not just going to use like sedum, which is, they'll, say, they'll tell you it's a plant, but it's basically a monoculture. It's one plant growing on a, on a roof. So we've tried to take uh, Danish occurring biotopes and see what are, the, what, what are the, the sort of positive sides that we can then use. Some of these biotopes are really, uh, they don't need a lot of water. Some of them are tolerant to salt. So imagine using it not just on a roof, but also uh, in conjunction with, uh, with the roadworks. And uh, because in Denmark we use salt on the road. If, if you, for example, use the, uh, the beach biotope, you'll need to add salt to it if there's not a, not a naturally uh, occurring uh, occurring salt. We'll try and use it uh, for green walls as well. The whole point is that it's Danish derived biotopes so you could actually only use them in Denmark. The thing is then you can expand that but we're, we're focusing on, on Denmark now and we're, we're doing uh, this together with uh, a biologist and uh, a greenery so we actually and they actually had to go out and say okay these are seeds that they normally consider uh, uh, yeah, unquote they, they normally consider uh, an in invasive plant, so they had to go out and find, so how do we grow this? Some of them, turns out, they need to be frozen before they'll, uh, they'll start growing. Some of them needs to be rubbed. Other of them needs uh, acid because they're normally eaten by birds. Um, so this, is, this has also been a, been a way of learning, not just on, on, the, on the building level, but also on, on plants. 
Um, this is also one of the cradle to cradle projects. I won't go too deep into that because that's a, an hour in itself. But it's it's basically a movable pavilion, which is it's it's going to be it's commissioned by Kovi, a big Danish uh, consultancy firm, and. It's basically trying to state that all that goes into the building should should go out again. For example, the the the, f the foundation of the building is it's just it just needs a flat foundation. Then there's a a water cushion underneath the building which actually acts as, as the foundation. So one of the ideas is that uh, when the when the pavilion arrives, fill it up with dirty water. There's then a plant wall inside which filt filtrates the water and recycles it. So that when the when the uh, the pavilion then leaves, you can basically tap off clean water. So this taking the foundations, which is normally sort of a bad footprint, and turning it into a to a positive uh, footprint. Yeah, exactly. This about recycling, uh, recirculating water in, inside the building, cleaning it, using uh, solar power to to power the pavilion. And this also then leads us into basically how we sort of try and work with cradle to cradle. We're not using it as a, uh, we're not necessarily using it as a, as, a, as a doctrine. We're taking the inspiration from it, the, especially the idea about you should do good, take your footprint and convert it into a positive one. This whole idea about looking at society, looking at the whole, in, the whole building industry in a holistic way, uh, we think that's, uh, that's really important and that's also drives me on to where did this actually come from because it started out with the one project we did. It's a pavilion uh, for a Danish exhibition uh, at, Lu at Luciana, the museum. And they came to us and said, we want to do 100% bio-derived materials. Uh, we want to do a pavilion. Can you help, me, help, help us with this? And we sort of took the inspiration in the tree and said, okay, so it should do good. It should be of 100% natural materials. It should be uh, good to the environment, it should be generating the energy that it needs, it should actually be giving back uh, some of the, the ideas. So one of the ideas was also to have air purifying surfaces on it that are photocatalytic. All you need to add is basically sunlight and water. Um, it was also looking at how does these materials cycle. And we started out by just saying, okay, so we want to do this in biological derived materials what is the possibilities. So we looked at natural fibers, uh, we looked at yeah, again non-woven natural fibers. Uh, a lot of these materials are available, they're not just, a, they're just not applied to the, to the building industry. We looked at uh, bio resins uh, and also using natural materials as, as, as the core material for this, uh, for this pavilion. And again, self-cleaning materials. How, how can we actually clean the air without really doing anything. The pavilion just needs to be there exposed to sunlight. Um, and also, how can we generate energy? How can we generate energy by... It's actually turned out it's a, it's a great uh, playground for, for kids. So if kids jump around on it, it would generate energy. When the sun shined, it would generate energy. And the final design sort of, we, we started out with, okay, so how can we use this as a pavilion? And it, we ended up with, okay, maybe a pavilion is not the best idea to show this because then you start to talk about all the legislations associated with a building. So we turned it a bit more in the direction of a sculpture. But some of the ideas then also turned out, okay, how can we actually do this? And we contacted a lot of uh, resin makers to use in, in the, for, for use of the resin in the composite and said, we want 100% biologically derived materials. And they said, what? It turns out that none of them actually thought that they needed to have 100%. They were starting to sort of add in maybe 10%, 20%. So it was also a, a learning curve for them, I think, because sometimes an, an industry will not, will not necessarily develop anything or a product without anybody saying, I want this product. So we started asking this product, and it also turns out that this, this was a spin-off to, to another uh, company. But this geometry, it was also just, we don't just push, push the material, we push the geometry, we push the manufacturing process. So it came out as, as this green uh, ribbon. Um, and as I said, it, it actually moved us on to another project, 
which is we now have a five million dollar euro uh, development project which we're doing together with four, 15 other uh, European companies which is making bio-derived composites. So now we're actually working with the resin makers on getting 100% biologically derived uh, composites and we'll be working with this for the next uh, next three years actually. And this also started us out with with the idea that maybe we should look at closed loops, maybe cradle to cradle is, is a good sort of reference point. So we also got in contact with uh, Vogue to Vogue, Denmark, the cradle to cradle uh, department in, in, in Copenhagen and we're actually now finishing up on a cradle to cradle building manual and this is not sort of like that you could then label your building as cradle to cradle, this is more like if you want to do a cradle to cradle inspired building there's certain things you should do. So this is sort of a guidance to how, the, how this could be done. The problem being that when you move from cradle to cradle on a design level to a building level, there's a lot of things that changes. I think all of you know this chair. It's a chair you can take, you can disassemble it into its basic parts. You don't need any uh, sophisticated tools to do so. And all the, all, the, all the materials of the parts can be reassembled or can be reused. But a building is not like that. A building is not something that you take apart. The, the problem with a building is actually that there's different cycles. There's the furniture. The furniture is maybe exchanged every year. There's water going into a building, which is, it goes in and goes out the same day. There's food, there's waste, and then there's, you look at systems, ventilation systems, solar panels, stuff like that has a lifetime that is shorter than the building itself because a structure of a building can be standing for 200 years. And then again, the site that you're building on, that's eternal. So when you remove your building, you should then return that into the state that it, it was before. And this moves me on to the main case that I'm going to be, be using to sort of try and explain on how we've, we've tried to do some of these things. Um, this is Green Solution House. I'll, I'll make a short sort of description of it. The, the whole idea is... Bornholm wants to be this bright green island. There's uh, four other islands, but the whole idea is they want to be front runners for green technology. And they can do that because they have 1% of the Danish population, 1% of the, of the area of Denmark, and they have 1% of the energy usage, and they have one connection to the mainland where they can measure the energy usage of the whole island. And this has actually turned out that right now, big companies like Siemens and IBM are on Bonholm testing what is the future of smart grids. So they're actually testing systems on a, on a island level, which is because they, they want to know how, how does this act in a, in a sort of a laboratory kind of uh, fashion before you apply it to the whole country, or before you apply it to the whole of Europe. And they can do this on Bonholm. And that is why Bonholm is also saying, okay, Maybe we should take this, this idea that we are isolated and actually run with it. It's a positive thing suddenly, because if you want to test technology, you want to do it in a reasonably controlled environment. And one home, for, especially for a lot of these green technologies, is a controlled environment. And it's actually turned out now that a big Chinese uh, company who produces electric cars, they were going to uh, unveil their car and they did it on one home instead of anywhere else, because Bonholm is now front-runner in these technologies. Um, and this is, this is then extending, because now there's uh, four other uh, islands that, that wants to be sort of, they want to move in the same direction. So it's, it's not just, it's no longer just Bonholm saying we want to be, we want to be green, we want to be self-sufficient in energy, we want to do this in an intelligent way. It's actually spreading now. And Again, just like Anhold, Bornholm is, it's, it's an island, it's a controlled environment. There's a lot of things that you can do there that you couldn't do on, on, on bigger, uh, in, in bigger contexts. So the Green Solution Houses then, it's, it's a hotel and a conference center to be used year round. In summer, there's a lot of uh, tourists and they, they don't have any problems with, with having people uh, in, in the hotels. But during the winter, now they have this, 
the sort of they have the uh, the influx of of engineers who need to to be live need to be living in a place they have to have conference uh, facilities where they can actually meet and talk about these things that that they're doing on these test uh, sites that they're, they're, they're doing so the idea is that it's basically uh, a and h are existing buildings and we're going to try and try and use those because the thing is also when you start something as as comprehensive as cradle to cradle you cannot just do business as usual we have to st you have to start all over on how you think we make architecture so we started out by working with the uh, with cradle to cradle out of uh, out of charlottesville and trying to say okay so we need to we need to do analysis on how we actually how, how are we going to do this what is the important parts and one of them was a, was a site analysis looking into what buildings can we reuse. There's no need to tear down a building if it's, if it's in good condition. Some of them, all of them needed renovation to some level, but some to a, to a greater extent than others. So we did a lot of analysis work on, not just on the buildings, but also on site. We needed to completely rethink the way that we, uh, we did architecture because the, the requirements are suddenly so different. Um, and it's also not just looking at the architecture, looking at what does the architecture affect, what is the baseline. This is for, uh, for, uh, yeah, for uh, mobility. How can, what, is, what is our baseline, what is our goal? We need to have sort of a, a starting point and we need to have a goal. And this was part of the, part of the process, actually saying, okay, what is, where do we want to be in, in 10 years when the building is done? And it was also looking at energy looking at where does the energy come from. This is, uh, this is von Holm's vision. They want to be completely self-sufficient with, uh, with renewable energy. But right now they're not. And it's also, we then also started to realize maybe this isn't viable to do in one go. Maybe a full cradle-to-cradle -cradle building is not, well, it, it could be possible, but the uh, financial implications of that would make it, yeah, nobody would put money into it because because the simple fact it wouldn't be great quality for, for, for the money. But it was also looking at biodiversity. How can we integrate biodiversity on site? How can we make sure that the building site is, is then returned to, uh, to, its, to its former state after, after use? Um, and also looking at what is the baseline and where do we want to go? And again, water. Water suddenly becomes because when you draw this diagram of what actually cycles through a building, you realize that a major part of this is water. So what, do we wanna, what, what are we going to do with this water? Are we going to just pour it into the sewage? Are we actually going to recover the nutrients and the, the, uh, the minerals in our wastewater and actually use it? Um, there's also legislations right now. We could, the technology is there as a, as Peter and, and, and Rena said, the technology is there for actually to drink your own sewage water. We're just not allowed to. So, well, we're currently not allowed to, I should say. Because what we then came up with is we're going to do generation design for the Green Solution House. It's going to be first generation where we're going to do minimum best practice that you can do today. And the building is then going to be evolving. We tend to think of, uh, of building as, a, as an infinite, as once it's designed, once it's built, it won't change. But functions change uh, constantly. And we change the buildings, can we do renovations? But if we don't think about these things in the design phase, it's going to be really hard to do. The example is, is currently on, on just single family housing is that we have a lot of buildings from the 60s and 70s. If we want to renovate them, it's really expensive because the Houses themselves weren't designed to be renovated. So our idea was to, we're going to build this building to be disassembled and upgraded continuously. Um, the project, the first stage project is, is then, you can see the, the two, uh, two existing buildings with, with this new building sort of uh, connecting them and actually bridging a lot of the, coal, uh, of the heat uh, bridges, the thermal bridges that we had uh, before. And then actually expanding out into the uh, in, into the into the site. Um, it's going to be a conference center. We try to design in as much flexibility as as possible, 
because we want this to be able to have big conferences. What about then in the, in the summer vacation? You want to be able to divide it up so that you can have, have different restaurants for different kinds of, kind of guests. And then also looking at the existing building. How do we actually upgrade this, this building? And yeah, the whole first floor is, uh, is, is rooms. And also how do we integrate some of these, these ideas? Where do we actually do it? So one of the ideas were also to, to have on-site production of food for the restaurant. It's, 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 it's really not that hard to do, and especially if we try and, uh, try and reuse uh, some, of the, some of the nutrients. We also have an idea that maybe not in first generation, but in second or third generation, we're going to do on-site wastewater management. And there's also the, the thing about energy production. Of course, you want to be self-sufficient with energy, but there's also the, the social uh, implications of doing so. If we all went home and plastered our houses with PV cells, we'd completely screw up the, uh, the electrical system. We wouldn't necessarily have fewer power stations. We'd just have power stations standing on standby for when the sun's not shining. So we need to do this in a... Uh, in a global context, or in a, at least in a local context, and especially on Bonholm, we uh, do this. Yeah, sorry, I'm, I missed. This is the uh, the living machine that we'll we'll be trying to incorporate with, which actually takes both uh, grey water and black water, and completely uses the nutrients and actually cleans the water in a in a biological uh, manner. The entrance uh, area with the with the new entrance between the, the two existing buildings, and seen from the uh, from the garden uh, behind with both of the wetlands and also with the with food production. Yeah, basic uh, renders. And the idea was also to take the house as as a uh, as a concept and then actually just extrude it out into the uh, into the space. Our problems now are that, how do we then do this? Because this is, this now we're starting to talk about, I, I don't know if there's any constructing architects here, but we now start to talk about, so how do we actually design the building to be built and disassembled? It's a huge challenge because it's completely changing the way we, we think we can't, we can use the, uh, the knowledge that we already have, but we need to, we can't just do business as usual. We need to, to go in and see on how, how can these things be designed in a completely new way. There are some things that you, you can't necessarily run electrical wires anywhere you want to because when you disassemble the buildings, where are you going to take in a wall element, are you going to take the electrical wires with you? Are you going to separate it? Is that time consuming? There's a lot of questions that we're, um, and I'm not uh, saying we have the answer to that because we don't. We're trying to, to, uh, to find the answer. And one of them is also how, do, how can we use uh, software tools like uh, building information modeling? Could we actually embed information on material level, on where does this material come from and where does it go, so that the, the BIM model doesn't just become the, the sort of the design model or the construction model, it actually becomes the service model that you would return to every time you wanted to do a change. You would go into the BIM modeling and, and look at it. And uh, we're actually working with Autodesk, who does the, the Revit program. We're actually working with our R&D unit on trying and using the, the Revit model, the, the information model, as an actual driver for the servicing of the building. A building like this, if you wanted to do a detailed analysis continuous, continuously of, of how it's running on, temperature levels, on ventilation levels, on CO2 levels, you would need, I don't know, 2,000, 3,000 data points. By using the, the, the BIM model, we could actually do this by just having 400 points and then simulating the remaining points. So this, this is one of the things that, that's also, uh, also moving in. How can we actually use the information that we're generating continuously during the design process? to actually run the building. Um, and also, maybe we don't want to do a completely self-sufficient building in the start. Maybe we want to do this as a part of, of the actual uh, evolution of the, of the energy uh, structure on Bonhong. 
if we work with, uh, with the other partners, if we work with the energy companies, if we work with waste <coughs> management companies, we can actually give a better result in the end because it, everything would be integrated into, into, the, into how, this, uh, how this is uh, implemented. Because, again, if, if everybody were self-sufficient, then who should run our energy net? Who, where do we get energy from? It's, we have to look at this on a, on a larger scale sometimes. I, I completely agree with that we should have all the renewable energy that we, uh, that we need. But maybe we shouldn't produce it on site. Maybe we should, but maybe we should then be able to, to do it intelligently in, in a larger uh, corporation. Yeah. And this is again with the sections of the building. How, how do we actually disassemble this building afterward? Where do we put the ventilation unit so that in 15 years it can be taken out and replaced easily? It does, it's, a lot of these things are stuff we need to rethink in, uh, in the way that we, uh, we do. And also how do we do the renovation of the existing building? It was made in the 70s, so that means that the separating walls just go straight through the, uh, the facade. I have a lot of thermal bridges. Our idea is now to actually move the, uh, the, the climate barrier out onto the outside of, of that to try and use this uh, area that were before it was a balcony, maybe use it as a, uh, as a covered uh, space. Um, there's, there's a lot of things, especially when, when you're use, reusing a, an old building. But then again, we don't want to tear it down because the basic structure of the building is good. The basic room uh, size is, is exactly what you want in a, in a modern hotel. Uh, the facilities, everything is, is there. So we shouldn't change what we don't need, need to change. Um, what I want to sort of end up with before the discussion is then where is this going? What is this leading to? We had another project uh, in Stockholm which was a, was a combined school and living quarters for the, uh, for the students combined with elderly uh, uh, housing and also a kindergarten and then actually looking at how can we integrate green technologies into this. So it also became that how can we integrate vertical farming so that we can actually produce food in, in the building? How can we use productive uh, greenhouses? And how can we maybe even make uh, algae not on uh, big lands, but actually use it as part of the so sun shading? How can we generate biomass on site instead of doing it outside of the cities and then moving it? Um, how can we do some of these things and how can we actually give back to the community? Um, how can we use wastewater management? Maybe not. Maybe design the system so we don't just do the uh, the wastewater for the for the building. We actually take in wastewater from the from the surrounding buildings. As cities get denser, we have a problem with our sewers. We need to either uh, put less rainwater into them, or we need to put the rainwater elsewhere, or we need to renovate them. Renovating this, a sewage system is. In a modern city, it's basically impossible. So, how can we maybe collaborate with the with, with the city and the municipality on on doing some of these uh, some of these things? And how can we then do this in a way that it becomes attractable, that we actually attract people into the building because we've done these these things? Um, and again, how can we cross-link some of these social uh, social social uh, needs that we have, how can we actually sort of use the parameters, use the, the requirements for the different functions to actually help them, help them combine. So yeah, as, as you see, this is going to be both a, a, a green school, it's a new school concept they're trying to develop, where they're going to teach about sustainability, but not just on a, on a uh, sort of a, on a biological level, but also on a financial level and on a business level. Um, and again, combining kindergarten, student housing, and all these uh, these green areas. So it becomes a hugely complex uh, building, and it's might be built in uh, five to ten years. It's sort of this is a really uh, early sketch, but the whole idea was to to stay, state how can this building become an attraction in its surroundings, and how can it give back to the to the community that's it that it's uh, located in.
Yeah. Okay.